Hey, Armin. Hey, Michael. How's it going? Good. Well, let's launch straight into this. Hello, everyone. Um, first, uh, Armin and I just discussed a little bit before we started recording about the content of this or the subject matter of this podcast. And I keep emphasizing this guy, Sogomon Talarian, which is critical and important and is important to me. And but he fits inside a broader context. And so we want to state right up front here. Uh, we're talking about the Armenian genocide, World War I. Uh, any, any broader context that you want to add, Armin? I mean, the whole period before 1914 is also known sometimes by this French phrase called the Belle Epoque or like the beautiful era. So oh. that, that's roughly this era, time frame like encompassing 18... Let's say 1871 to 1914, where really Europe was able to enjoy a good 30, 50 years of relative peace. At the very least, the uh, European powers weren't warring with one another. And it's referred to as the beautiful era because of the fact that there was this flourishing in literature and in the arts. And sometimes Ottoman historians are also are referring to this period in the empire as also the, the Belle Epoque. Again, once the, the First World War begins, it seems as if like the entire world is just turned topsy-turvy and everybody kind of reflects and uh, has like this nostalgic feel for the period. Mm. And I think, you know, even uh, Tellerian's life really fits into this if we contextualize it in the, in the right way, not just like Absolutely. An, an Armenian guy who happens to be from a small little village, but also like a person who's living in this period of tumultuous events and movements and uh, revolutions and uh, things of that sort. I want to start off with some points of clarification. This is becoming a regular segment. Uh, as I watch back our previous segment, I, I realize there are things that I'm still not clear about or things that the viewer may not be clear about. Um, and so this will be a regular uh segment I do up top, I have several points of clarification. Do you have any that come to mind, Armin? I think it was the one that I raised just a few days ago with you, right? I think it was this belated realization that I mistakenly referred to Peter Jackson's documentary last time by a different title. I, I, did I, I think I got that uh, mixed up, right? So it's, they shall not be, they shall not grow old, right? Not they shall not be forgotten, which is for some well, reason I always... Uh, the, it the, up. the funny thing about that is I for forever couldn't remember the name of the movie properly either. And what you said is what I would always come up with, like completely independently. I would always say, uh, they I think it's they shall not be forgotten or something. And so when you said it, I didn't even I didn't even hear it, even though I knew that was the name of it. I didn't hear it wrong because that's what I sometimes had said mistakenly. So they shall not grow old was the name of the movie, not they shall not be forgotten. And they shall not grow old actually is a little more profound when you go into the film realizing, and, and in particular, there's one scene where that's pointed out at the end that this one scene of all these soldiers it was shot about 30 minutes before they went to battle and every one of them had died in that battle. So you're watching all these faces looking at the camera and all kind of goofing around. They're just soldier boys messing around and they go into battle and they all die within a half an hour of that shot. So they shall not grow old is, is a, it's a good name, but um, I didn't catch it either until afterwards. When I, was watching I think it, back. it sounds more logical too, right? Like when you think of the the documentaries that they shall not be forgotten because you have all their recordings and audio and video. But when you say they shall not grow old, it's almost as if it's like in a placing it like on a philosophical plane. It's a different right different it, it's, way of really thinking of you're the thinking. Soldiers. Right, you're thinking the documentary is made so they won't be forgotten, and so that's what is logical. You know, it sounds like a logical name, but it's definitely more philosophical and profound. The actual title, "They Shall Not Grow Old," and actually, I had a point of clarification on that as well. And watching back, I at one point I said, "The reason it's not like a regular documentary, or it's it, it doesn't really qualify as a normal documentary," and then I didn't really go on to explain why I I think that. 
and the reason is we covered a lot of it, but I didn't specifically state why most people that watch documentaries are expecting to hear some voiceover, some narrative and some explanation. And you cut to an interview with somebody and then you go to some B-roll, et cetera, et cetera. This documentary, aside from the piece at the very end that I don't think is technically considered a part of the documentary, where Peter Jackson's talking about how the process, the, the making of it. The reason it's not like a normal documentary is during the, the entire documentary, it's only footage and only audio uh, uh, narration or uh, all the voiceover is just people reading the letters of those actual soldiers, like from the time period, letters that they had written to family or their reflections on the war. And so all you hear when you're sitting there, you sit there, you, you sit down and it just starts rolling black and white choppy footage and then you hear voices you know of older men reading letters of actual uh, some of the voices uh well i don't i don't know that any of the voices of of the actual men but it's definitely war veterans it's the people reading the letters and for the entire duration of the actual documentary you don't have cutaways to a narrator talking about what happened and this or that. It's just you're immersed. You're listening to these guys' voices from the midst of the action, and then you're watching the action and the process, the, the technical process of taking it from black and white to smoothing it out and colorizing it and the, the voice over the, the lip reading and the, uh, the, the voiceover actors and the sound, sound design all unfold gradually until you're fully immersed. So it doesn't feel like a documentary. You're, you're not going in there and being informed about this thing and that thing. You're just hearing it from the soldier's point of view and seeing it from the old camera. So that's why it's, a, it's different than any other documentary. All right, moving on from that, I have a couple other points of clarification. Number one, or number two, whatever we're on. Uh, here's another thing that I wanted to clarify, and you can help me elaborate on this. When we were talking about where Sogomon was during World War I, and I kept talking about the Russian front, the Russian front. He was on the Russian front. And I did clarify, clarify at one point that he was in the volunteer regiments on the Russian front. How many fronts did the Russians have during World War I? I mean, technically, they were active on three fronts. So the first one, which is usually referred to, or the first and second ones are usually uh, referred to as a combination as the Eastern Front. So there's one against the German army. Then there was another, at least in the first stages of the war. And then the second one was against the Austro-Hungarian army, which was centered in this one part of the eastern part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire called Galicia, what's now modern Poland. And that usually is the second front that historians refer to. And of course, the third one is the Caucasus front, where the Russians were pitted against the, the Ottomans. So really and that's the one. Fronts. Right. Yeah, so it's in it's in that third one, wherever I say he was on the Russian front during the war, it's that third one in the Caucasus. Now, when most people talk about World War I and they refer to the Eastern Front, where do they, what are they referring to? Again, it should be referring to the Russians and the, the Germans fighting over, again, these territories like in Galicia, what's also now part of Poland, but was part of Germany at the time, Eastern Prussia. So again, during the first six months to really the, mid, the spring of 1915, the Russians and Germans and the Austro-Hungarians were just pitted against this one part of the region until finally the, the Germans actually were able to make a little bit more headway in this trench warfare that we were so accustomed to associating with World War I. Got it. So technically, even though technically the Caucasus were further east, when most people refer to the Eastern Front in World War I, they're not talking about the Caucasus. They're talking about uh, where you're talking about P Poland and, and Austro-Hungary. Oh, or what's now Western, what's now Western Ukraine and Poland and. Got it. A couple more points of clarification, and this is one that uh, I think partly when I when we were recording, you were cutting out, so I wasn't hearing everything you were saying when you were talking about. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles and when Sogomon was in Paris. Uh, and at one point I asked you, when was the Treaty of Versailles signed? And I think I, I got two different dates out of you. Uh, initially you said August 10th for something, and then you said July 28th. 
And so can you clarify what those two dates are if they are in, if I was misunderstanding? Right. So June 28th, 1919 was when the Treaty of Versailles was signed between Germany and the Allies. And that was the first treaty that the Allies signed with the defeated Central Powers. And the Austro-Hungarians came in, I think, second, and then the Bulgarians third. And then finally, August 10th, 1920, so more than a year later, was when the Allies finally got around to drafting the peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire. And that was signed in this suburb of Paris called Sèvres. I think it was in a porcelain factory, if I'm not mistaken. I remember reading that. And that was supposed to be the treaty that would have concluded peace between the Allies and the Ottomans, but it was never ratified, at least by the Ottoman side, and really never implemented. But as the summary of the previous video also writes, like if it had been implemented, the whole map of the Middle East might have actually looked much differently because it was right. going to not even leave an Ottoman Empire to speak of. It was going to be just this small little state in the center of what's now Turkey. And that's, I mean, that was the significant treaty for Sogomon and for the Armenians. That was the one. And, and, and so still, I still maintain that Sogomon Talirin is the Forrest Gump of World War One, or of for, the Forrest Gump of the Ottomans and the Armenians because he was in all these significant places. And he was in Paris on August 10th during the initial signing or the signing of the Treaty of, how do you pronounce it? Sev? In proper French, yeah, Sevre. The, Sevres. The ro- yeah, you have to roll the R. We, what would we Americans say? The Treaty of Severus? Yeah, if, uh, if it's the first time you use Severus, that's how it looks like. Yeah, Severus. All right, good, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, and then what else? Oh, the last thing I want to do as a point of clarification, just in general for this podcast, uh, I keep referring to the project I'm working on as a movie. Like I've written a script and based on the memoir of Sogomon Talirian, and and that's out of habit that I refer to it as a movie. The fact is, it's very possible that it will be a series, uh, whether it's a mini series or a multi season series. I think that's actually the best way to tell this story would be over several episodes and a couple of seasons because it's such a big story and so engrossing and there are so many interesting and important characters that you would want to follow. So uh, I'm going to try and modify the way I talk about it, even though I, I'm in the habit of referring to it as a movie. Um, I'm just probably going to refer to it as a project because it could turn into something bigger than just a movie. And, and in fact, um, a little little insight here. I did talk to uh, my friend Ralph Winter about this. He, he he read the version of the script that I gave to him, and as we talked, he, he he made those points. There's a lot of characters, and this might do better as a series. And that's always kind of been in in play uh, from the beginning. It's been thought a thought that I and my business partner have had as well. So that point of clarification: if it's a movie, great. But if it's a series, even better. So we'll just call it the Sogomon Tellurian Project from here out. I mean, calling it the project has like a nice mysterious uh, tone to it too, so I actually like it as well. Well, at the very least, it's certainly going to be a, the publication of the English translation of the memoir. That's like guaranteed, um, and that's actually the, a big starting point for most projects. Most projects that are based on true stories have to start with some original source material, and so we've already taken care of that. So the project is well underway as far as what it's ultimate uh, on-screen version will be, and maybe it'll be both. Maybe it'll start as a series, and then we'll do a, uh, you know, a couple of years after that, do the just the movie on Sogomon. We'll see. We'll see. That's the nature of the beast here in Hollywood. It's it's an ever-evolving, uh, sometimes eter- eternal feeling development process. All right. We're in the home stretch of a centennial of two events, the assassination of Talat Pasha. Pasha. See, I did it. I mispronounced Pasha. Pasha. At least you're catching yourself this day. <laughs> I caught myself. So, we're in the home stretch of the 100 year anniversary of when Sogomon Talirian assassinated a world leader named Talat Pasha. This is the section I'm going to reserve to talk about Sogomon. You know, in this podcast, I want to talk about the broader context, but maybe we'll just say the countdown section is just the Sogomon section. Um, and. 
I want you, uh, before I talk a little bit about Solomon, can you explain to me, Armin, the different political factions within Armenia? There's, as far as I know, at least three political parties. And can you just briefly explain what they are or were? Yeah, I mean, I can definitely put them in their context, at least at the time of the outbreak of the, the war for the period that we're talking about. So in about the, the late 1880s or so, there were a number of Armenians who decided that the approach of the Ottomans to implementing reforms had not gone anywhere in improving Armenians, you know, well, well, uh, welfare and livelihood in these provinces in the Eastern Ottoman Empire where most Armenians lived. And because of that, there was a certain segment of Armenian society in both the Ottoman Empire and in the Russian Empire that perhaps through arms or through political agitation that, you know, uh, through political agitation that change can be brought about. And so in the 1880s, you have these Armenians in the Russian Empire and who are also studying elsewhere, say in Europe, uh, establishing these committees and organizations. And one of them is known as the Armenian Revolutionary Federation or the Dashnak Tutun. And that's founded in the town of, or the city of Tiflis, or now Tbilisi, capital of Georgia in 1890. And the other one is, well, this was, it was established three years earlier in 1887, known as the Hunchak Party in Geneva. And these were, there was a, another uh, a party, a third party, the known as also the, the Ramkavar or Constitutional Party. And they are oftentimes no, are not really considered a revolutionary party because of their platform. But these two other parties, they differed in their outlook. They both wanted to see the conditions of Armenians improve in the Ottoman Empire, but they differed on how they wanted to go about it. And they also had different visions. So this party, the Hunchak party, for example, wanted to establish an independent Armenia, at least as it was understood at the time, and to create a so, you know a socialist society because socialism was also a very popular intellectual trend at the time. And as a matter of fact, they took their name from uh, the from a contemporary Russian party a newspaper that is that also uh, that also had the same name. So Hunchak means basically a clarion or a, a bell, and it was also the same in Russian Kalako. So they thought this would be the best way of improving, you know, the lot of Armenians, whereas the ARF, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, they thought that they could still work within the confines of, they could still work within the, the Ottoman Empire and create a sort of uh, autonomous Armenia, but still it was not going to be independent. And how they ultimately went about to these changes is you know a very long history but you know they were not beyond taking violent means or taking up arms at least we can put it that way against the ottoman state and its agents and this just uh remained a big issue for the ottoman state itself and armenians all the way into the the first world war because these organizations were very active politically and really until they were gained legal status they operated underground and so they were these subversive organizations which had these pretty cool secret names and mm. uh, you know if you went you know they had their hideouts and they were operated in this region where between the Ottoman Russian and Persian borders uh, the border of the Iran where they could smuggle arms and smuggle pamphlets and try to agitate in, in order to gain their political objectives. You can't, so, you can't ask me these kinds of questions for <laughs> just to summarize in a couple of minutes. No, no, I know. I'm, but you did. I love springing things on you like this because you do an amazing job off the cuff. You weren't expecting that question at all. And uh, a brief history was real quick. And so there's the Ramgavars, the Hunchaks, and the Dashnak, the ARF. Um, now, would you say... Uh, and you, and you, you distinguish... There was the Russian Armenians, then the Ottoman Armenians, even though Armenia 
is one. They kind of straddle these two empires. Were were these three parties localized, separated because of where they were, or were they more popular? Was one party more popular in one section and one party more popular in another place? If you could elaborate. Yeah, I mean, like the political environments that these committees, if you want to call them that, rather than necessarily political parties, because we may have a different idea of what a, a political party is when we're talking about this period. But Got it. The political environment, at least in the Russian Empire, was slightly more tolerant to have these kinds of organizations and this kind of civic activism. Again, the Russian Empire, by the turn of the 20th century, was also turning a suspicious eye toward the Armenians and they weren't necessarily as accommodating toward their political aspirations or objectives than they were, let's say, 30, 40 years ago. And so they were allowed to spring up in the Russian Empire and be a little active, have their meetings. But in the Ottoman Empire, it was much more difficult because this was a time when an autocratic emperor or sultan was reigning. And of course, that was Abdul Hamid II. And having these kinds of subversive committees would not necessarily be something that he would be wanting to tolerate. And again, these Armenian organizations were not the only ones to be active, at least in among like, let's say non-Muslims or even Muslim, Muslim organizations in the empire in their opposition to the Sultan. So you also had say Bulgarian and uh, other uh, uh, Greek committees who were also kind of agitating for their own reasons. They also wanted to achieve their own separate objectives. And oftentimes this was one way that the committees would cooperate with one another and uh, try to you know work toward the same ends. So political party isn't necessarily the right term. I mean, even though they fulfill, you know, like a political party will have its platform and it's different you know, differentiated views on things. So it's similar to a political party in that regard, but it didn't function as, you know, recognized arms of the governmental structure or anything like that, right? Yeah, and again, in both of these imperial contexts in the Russian and the Ottoman, you had different set of circumstances. So in 1905, Russia gains its own constitution and its own imperial parliament. And that's when people from the Russian Empire could send their delegates to sit in this session. And for the Armenians, they sent representatives from, I believe, the ARF, and I'm not sure if the, the Hunchak party also had its own, but they were at least able to operate on a more traditional, I guess you can call it a political level, than, say, in the Ottoman Empire, where these were more like, com again, committees and uh, subversive committees where they were usually using more covert means to, to mm -hmm. get their objectives. They weren't always necessarily going to the Ottoman Sultan and petitioning and uh, patiently waiting for his response. Got it. Well, how about today? Did the all three of these, would they be more political parties today? Would they be considered that today or do they still exist at all? Yeah, so these organizations are still active to this day and in the Republic of Armenia, these you know, they form just three of the number of political parties that are there Got it. Well, the, take part in politics. Got it. Well, so the reason I bring this up is, um, and this is all discovery to me, a discovery process for me. Um, and so because Sogomon, when he assassinated Talat, he was put in place... Uh, and supported, and the infrastructure, the spy, you know, the espionage, espionage the covert uh, goings on, you know, getting information and being funded was because of the Dashnaks, the, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation, right? And one thing I, I encountered, you know, to this day, the information about Sogomon is is not, there are just a few important details out there, but a lot of people who know his story think that he was a political animal or that he was a, he was a, he was just, he was associated from the beginning with the Armenian Revolutionary Federation and, 
and that uh, everything he did was under their guidance. Um, but in our research, we discovered that's not exactly true, right? I think there's still some room for us to do some exploration, but he definitely had some sort of affinity for them by the time of the, the peace treaties when they were being hashed out in 1919, 1920. I think he even says in his memoir that the ARF was really the most active on this front to not only be the leaders of this new Republic of Armenia that was established at the right at, toward the end of the war, but also to be on the tails of the, the Committee of Union Progress leaders who were responsible for the Armenian genocide and to attain some sort of justice. So he clearly had a, a sort of partiality toward them, I think, by, by this time. And he, ready, and he readily admits that uh, in a conversation, at least the first hint that I have encountered, or I mean the earliest hint uh, uh, based on all the information we have in his memoir is when he gets to Istanbul uh, and he meets, what's her name? Do you remember her name? Yes, I do. She's on the tip of my tongue. Uh, Danielian is the last name. Yeranuhi. Yeranuhi Danielian. Uh, can you describe who she was? So she's also a person who makes a very important appearance in the memoir, but she's, I really wish we, I, I'm hoping there's still some sort of, you know, information to uncover about her, but she. If anybody out is, there knows about her, text us and reach yeah, out to us because we want, yeah, please we want more information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If maybe one of her relatives is watching this, it would be very helpful if uh, yes. they reached out and let us know. So She moved she, to California. Yeah. So she uh, she meets Tellurian in Istanbul at the, after the, the war ends. And I think it's just this very ch chance encounter, right? I think they're at a newspaper office and mm -hmm. they just happen to strike a conversation and they see that they can connect on so many levels because they shared the same same uh what do you call it? the they they both like the same poetry and they also happen to know the same people it's a very small world at that time apparently and she kind of acts as this female agent who helps him achieve like his first objective before he even decided to go after talat you know she's very instrumental in this and again that's why i find her character so fascinating and well there's a there's a there's a piece of dialogue that he records in his memoir when they actually get into just briefly a political discussion or they reveal their political affi affiliations or their, their affiliation or their leanings toward one of these three committees that you've explained. Do you remember that, that exchange? I think I remember them identifying with their committees and them still agreeing that you know, it makes no difference that they're still out to achieve the same thing. I, I think I remember that much. Right. So she, I don't know if he says it or she says it, but she's a Hunchak and he's a Dashnak. And it's almost, I, you know, my only point of reference is like, I'm a Republican and I'm a Democrat, right? It's like they're, they're, <laughs> they are opposed, you know, inevitably when you're a part of a different group and there's another group, there's going to be some animosity. We have the right belief and we know we have the right way of doing things. But because of the devastation that had just happened, those differences evaporated. Like they, whatever differences they may have had in a political argument before the war, completely evaporated. They were united in a purpose. She was She's described in his memoir as very politically active, and she was like his source of information and plays a very significant role in him actually being connected to Operation Nemesis, right, eventually. We're not going to go into all those details now, but I, I did want to, uh, I, I wanted to spend a little time talking about that, and I knew you'd have uh, valuable contributions to the discussion. Yeah. I mean, just to also put her in a little bit of perspective, too, she wasn't the first woman who joins these revolutionary organizations before the war they again this is something which scholars have only just recently begun to dig up details on but there were women who were 
active in the movement against Sultan Abdul Hamid in the Ottoman Empire hmm. 15, 20 years earlier. And it's quite possible they may have even taken their lead from the Russian populist movement, which was active in the 1860s and 1870s in trying to either topple or assassinate the, the Russian Tsars. And there were many women who also kind of you know, uh, earned their baptism in fire by taking part in these violent acts against the, the emperor. So it's once you kind of take a, a step back, like you can actually put them into a little more, you know, a different perspective. But it's, again, fascinating nonetheless to, to see their role in all this. One final thing on this particular topic. Uh, again, we won't go into detail, but Sogomon did assassinate another a government official uh, prior to the assassination of Talat Pasha, Sogomon assassinated an Armenian informant in Istanbul. And in my research and interviewing and talking to other Armenians, uh, one thing that is a misunderstanding uh, to a lot, well, any people, any ARF members that I've met and talked to, uh, at least one or it may be a common understanding is their belief is that he was hired or that that was an, an ARF hit that he was put up to that assassination by the ARF when he hadn't been connected with the ARF higher ups at all. That was, that was completely, at least the way it's depicted in the memoir was completely his own action. He never got connected to them until a couple of years later or at least a year, year and a half later. Right? Yeah, I think that was my impression from it too. He just seemed to be surprised that this guy, you know, we won't talk about him too much, it's just... We'll get to it. the good life. Yeah, living the good life, but nobody's done anything. Yeah, and, you know, Danielle and Yeranuhi is the one that told him about, told Solgamon about this guy, and he couldn't believe this guy had betrayed his people and was essentially living large off of blood money and took it upon himself to get a little bit of vengeance. All right, let's move on. Uh, I want to talk briefly before we get to movie talk. So we're going to, we've, we've picked a movie to talk about at the end and we're getting close to there, but I want to talk briefly about uh, a part of my uh, journey. You know, so we've talked about how Armin and I met. We talked about Abriel Bookstore. Talked about uh, reading the the court transcript that I have over here. We talked about reading this book, Operation Nemesis. Um, and, but in my hunt for this book, the memoir here, when I found out it existed, I'm knocking things over on my shelf back here. Sorry. Um, when I found out this existed, I couldn't believe it, and then I Googled it. And I found, this was in late October of uh, 2017, and I'm like, Sogolman Tellurian memoir, I, so, Tellurian memoir, I Googled it, and I find, lo and behold, there's an English translation that's about to be published. I, I couldn't believe it. I went to this website, and lo and behold, there it is. And it had, I remember distinctly, it said, uh, release date, publication date, November 11th, 2017, order now. Sure enough, it was like 36.95 or whatever, and it's a, a publication company out of Europe somewhere. And so I, I, I ordered my copy. I couldn't believe my good luck. I had just come to this story. I had just discovered that Sogum Tellerian was this incredible character from history and that he had written his own memoir and there's no way I could read it as, Ar as Arno from the bookstore said, even if I had a copy, you couldn't read it. It's never been translated. I go online. I can't believe the timing of it. It says it's going to be published in November 11th, a couple of weeks from that point. But that wasn't true, was it, Armin? <laughs> no, it certainly was not. It took a lot so, longer. Or... <laughs> Long story short, there was this publisher that was... I won't tell the whole story. We'll get into it later. But uh, there was a publisher that was apparently translating it uh, or had translated it. I don't know what the story was, but 
when I went back, I remember some time went by. I'm like, wow, I never got my copy. And it was probably like December of 2017. I went back to the website and the release date had changed. It had moved to like January 24th or, and then I check again and it moved to like March 17th. It just kept moving for like a year. I would go back and check and the date kept moving and I didn't understand it. Well, fast forward to, um, I do want to go into more detail about this later, but I got in touch with the family uh, and we found out that, you know, that this publisher was not going through the right, you know, channels. You know, it wasn't necessarily something nefarious. Uh, I really think it's some, something that's kind of fell through the cracks. And because I found the family, we ended up, you know, putting the kibosh on that and getting the translation done ourselves. And it's almost done. I mean, the translation is almost done. A, a reliable translation. We have no idea who they had translating it, but we know our translation is good, right? I mean, tell, talk briefly about our translation, Armin, from what you've read. Just comment on the quality of it. Yeah, I think that was something which I really appreciate when I read it. Again, it's we're just getting the bits and pieces as our translator works on it. But what I really like is just how he's able to do, again, no translation is ever going to be as good as the original, but what it really does well is just preserve the, not only the, the meaning behind the words, but also to capture like the feeling and the, give it like a, a almost like this lyrical feel to it. Because Tellurian, from what I understand, and I was, I forget where exactly I heard this. So Tellurian himself did not actually write the, the memoir himself. It was his friend from the ARF whose name at the moment escapes me because the memoir is written in Eastern Armenian and Tellurian, of course, wrote in Western Armenian. And having read some of Tellurian's own letters and these other documents, you get, you know, you can definitely see like the, the difference between them. But that doesn't mean that, you know, he didn't actually compose his memoir. It's just that it was transcribed in a different dialect. But even the transcription is the way that it came out in the memoir. It has this real interesting feel to it so that it's like almost like this story that he's telling and it's so vivid and none of it is written in this you know old stodgy language. It's really just written in this free-flowing way and you are really in like Tellurian's own like headspace whenever he's like talking about what he's feeling, what uh, what he's seeing. And in the translation that we have going, I, I'm very glad to to see that it's also, it's being preserved as it's going from one format to another. So, Well, you're opening up a Pandora's box. I'm, I've got a thousand things I want to say, but I'm going to avoid it until next week. <laughs> so let's move on. We're we're going to get to our last segment here. All right. What are we, what movie are we talking about, Armin? Tell me about so, it. Okay. So, well, we're talking about a movie that I haven't actually seen. It was your mm -hmm. suggestion and it's the Patriot's Day. And I had to go on to Wikipedia to read, not only read the summary because I didn't even know what the, the movie was about. And even though it came out fairly recently, I don't think I even heard about it when it was released. And do you want me to... Just a synopsis, okay. yeah. Okay, so from what I remember, it takes place during the, the Boston Marathon and the Boston Marathon bombings, that is. And that was not too long ago. It was back in 2013. So it's uh, not necessarily maybe something we would call a historical drama because most people I think watching this would be even, even be able to remember where and when they were when they first heard about it. Right, so... Patriots Day, turns out, uh, is a, an annual holiday in, in Boston. It's the day of the marathon every year, and they call it Patriots Day. I think the Red Sox also schedule a, a game on that day every year, a, a baseball game, a home game, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, a gather. I didn't look into that detail specifically, but I think that's the case. Um, and so that day is a it's like a, a national a local national holiday for bostoners or maybe all massachusettsans people from massachusetts and so that's a, a bit of 
America, Americana, American history that, you know, the rest of the country may not, you know, most of the rest of the country is not aware of. And so the name of the movie is based on, is, is taken from that holiday. And uh, do you remember the name of the bombers? Yes, and I, when I was reading the, the summary, it mentions them. So, Johar Tsarnaev, and I forget the second guy's name, though. The older brother, yeah, I don't remember either. Yeah, I, do, I mean, they're, they were both from, I think they were both from the, the North Caucasus region in what's now Russia. Uh, that I remember yes. reading that in their background. So, this movie is a... Uh, the reason I, so I was just, you know, my wife put it on and uh, she usually falls asleep about 10 minutes into any movie we watch, no matter what it is, even if she's interested. Uh, so I, I'd seen it before and this was just a couple of weeks ago. She, she put it on, I, I, I don't know, it was Netflix or something that it's on. So it stars uh, Mark Wahlberg, Kevin Bacon, John Goodman. Oh, uh, J.K. Rowling. Yeah, J.K. Rowling. No. Wait. The author from the <laughs> no, uh, uh, Simons, J.K. J.K. Rowling, uh, oh, J.K. Simmons. Simmons, yes. Yeah, yeah, I love him. Uh, so, um, I always say Rowling when I mean Simmons. Uh, so, some really, really good, you know, major talent. And I'm watching, and I remember it being historically accurate or I remember from the first time I watched it so watching it again I'm like oh, okay this might be an interesting movie for us to talk a little bit about in our podcast because my goal in the in the Sogma Tolerian project is to be as historically accurate as possible and so this is a movie that's a good and bad example they, they, it, it's a good example in one sense but it's also a bad example in another sense and that's what I want to talk about uh, in in a good sense they they stuck like they used actual footage like some of the surveillance footage they they used it and and it was incorporated seamlessly like some of the, when they have a uh there's a sequence where they're trying to find who planted these two bombs and they use the actual surveillance footage of when and there's a time that they uh, what, some of the things that it's perfect for, you know, as far as a narrative, it's like this horrible thing happened and they caught the guys. So there's justice. So it has that important arc in a story. It's not the bad guys got away. They caught the guys. So justice is served at the end. And then another thing that's perfect uh, for, for you know, that's usually very good for a, a, a crime drama or a suspense drama uh, is it's a, sh a sh narrow window. So there's a ticking clock and they, they use the actual time frames. every now and then a, a graphic would pop up 36 hours after bombing, 72 hours after bombing. So it, it's something that gets solved quickly, you know, and so they were accurate to the time frame, and, and they show the, the footage of when that first FBI guy noticed that when the first bomb went off, in this camera, everybody's looking that way, except this one guy looks the other way. It's as if this guy didn't, he knew it was going to happen. And like, that was their first clue. And so it's riveting to follow the actual investigation. And they were pretty accurate. In fact, Kevin Bacon's character was a real character. John Goodman's character was a real character. There's even a interview in the, in the credits with the actor that John Goodman portrays. He's like, wow, I can't believe he studied my mannerisms, even got my dialect down. And so when you're watching it, you're like, okay, so a lot of these things really happen. And then there's a sequence where the two brothers, as they're trying to escape, they carjack this, this kid in his bent. He's like a Mercedes or something, a nice, nice SUV. And this kid was on he was the an set. MIT student, right? He was what? I think he was like an MIT student. I remember reading that in the, the summary. Yes. And so he was on the set advising like for his scenes. And, and he said afterwards, like they got it. They got it as close as possible. In other words, when he's in the vehicle, when they carjack him, there's dialogue going on, there's things happening and it's dramatic 
And this kid is saying that's pretty much what it was like. And and he they they, they throw in these little details. For example, he ends up they have to stop for gas and he 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 seizes an opportune moment and jumps out and runs to a convenience store across the street and hides you know, in the in the closet while the 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 uh, store clerk is calling nine one one or whatever, and then they cut to the surveillance footage of this. The, you know, they cast the characters to look almost you know as close as possible. And it's like, wait, I can tell that's not the actor. I can tell that's the actual footage. They even did it with one of the the brothers, uh, one of the ter- one of the bomber brothers. They cast him. They found this incredible actor, Alex Wolf, who plays the younger brother. Uh, looks so much like the actual bomber. And so there's this one moment when the guy who got carjacked and escapes, when Mark Wahlberg shows up at the at, at the store, the guy goes, oh yeah, they took my vehicle and uh, we have GPS, tra- I have a GPS tracking and the GPS ID number is, and he rattles it off. And, and, <laughs> and Mark Wahl- Wahlberg goes, you memorized your GPS tracking number? And he's like, yeah. And it was true. Like the kid had actually memorized his own GPS tracking number for some reason. And and it was critical in tracking these guys down. And so uh, I really enjoyed the film in that regard that they even tried to film in the same neighborhood when they captured the kid. They tried to film in the same neighborhood, but because it was such a uh, still such a sensitive issue, they only, they filmed the movie within like two years. It came out in 2016. So they were filming it in 2015, 20 probably late 2014 and 2015, which is real close to the events of 2013. And so they didn't get permission to film in the same neighborhoods, but they, they, some of the scenes like JK Simmons house, the, the, the actor or the, the police detective or the sergeant that he portrays, they filmed in that guy's house, like with JK Simmons and the actress that played his wife, they filmed it. So, so many of the uh, locations are accurate. So those are all the reasons that. Go ahead. I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of that film that Clint Eastwood directed just a couple of years ago based on the that attempted hijacking on the train in, that, in that came to, or in that, Belgium. That movie came and to he, mind as well. He actually have, yeah, and he actually cast like the same people. The actual were, guys. Yeah, the actual guys. That's a teaser because I do want to talk about that film in another episode. Uh, I, I do want to talk about that and, and a reason that I liked it and I didn't like it, but... So all the things I just talked about were uh, examples of, you know, how this film did it right. I think it's important because this was an important event in our history. And one of the things that was problematic in the telling of the story, and it's a thing that Hollywood deals with all the time, is Mark Wahlberg's character. All right. So I, I tend to like Mark Wahlberg. In, in fact, I've been mistaken for his brother. Like, hey, are you related to Mark Wahlberg? I'm like, no. <laughs> but uh, I like him generally as an actor. I, you know, he does some good stuff and some bad stuff. They all they all make mistakes and pick bad roles. But and I liked him in this movie, but his character was not real. The, the reason they did that and it's it's it happens a lot. Uh, in film, especially when trying to deal with the true story, there was no single character that was at all these critical moments throughout the his- the actual historical events. There wasn't one guy, one police officer that solved this whole crime. Um, and so they created this, I, they, they say he was a composite of a couple of different characters. I don't, I'd have to go and look at it again to see, you know, who he was a composite of multiple characters. But even so, I don't think it was. I, th- I think it I think it could have been done better. Um, I think Rotten Tomatoes gives it a, a good rating critically, but it wasn't a very big commercial success. And I think it wasn't a commercial success because of that main character arc that they they were forcing him into certain situations that he really wasn't there but he also wasn't there often enough like his story arc wasn't strong enough to pull you in to care about him even though this was about actual events you still 
have to care about your protagonist. And just because Mark Wahlberg is from Boston and this is his home turf, I, I think that's that's good. I mean, it was a, it was a passion project for him, but I, I don't think they had, I don't think the script was strong enough to pull you into his character. Um, and the opposite is true in our story. We happen to have Sogamon Tellerian who was at all these critical moments in the story. And that's why I wanted to compare and contrast this film with ours. Yeah, I mean, something other crossed my mind or, well, two things now crossed my mind since we're talking about composite characters. One, of course, is The Promise, because the protagonist in that film. We'll have to take a couple one. episodes to talk about that one. I know, but he was, he's, he can arguably be made to be a, a composite character. I guess yeah. maybe yeah. that's what the, the filmmakers are trying to do. But also the HBO series from last year, Chernobyl, also had a woman scientist who was also kind of this composite character where she's on the scene for a lot of the uh, a lot of the parts of the series, including on the you know investigating, first having suspicions about it, and then actually being in the courtroom as a witness, or I think also in the same room with the Soviet leadership at the time. So that it, it's interesting how when you uh, pointed out to like other people also bring that up as like a point of criticism, like having these kinds of composite characters. And it's interesting because I read it on Wikipedia too, that there was some criticism that Mark Wahlberg's role is not an actual, an actual person. Yeah. And I mean, getting back briefly to the promise, that was actually the biggest issue I had with, well, not the biggest issue I had with it because I had, I only saw that movie. Here we are talking about another movie and I wanted to cut, I wanted to cut out here. Let's talk briefly. I, I saw that movie after I had started my research on this, the Armenian genocide project. And so I recognized a lot of the context. I, you know, I recognized the background and, and then when the movie was over, I went immediately to look at who are these characters and they weren't real characters. And, you know, at the, at best, they could be composites, but there's no real characters. Maybe, maybe Christian Bale's character is based on an, an American newspaper man, but, but as far as the protagonist, um, uh, our, our Oscar Isaac's character, you know, there's not really any one person or two or three people that he's a composite of, even though there were, arguably a few people that went through some of those things. And so it's inevitably something Hollywood runs into when trying to tell a true story is, well, these are the events, the important events of the story, but we have to draw the, the audience in. And so it has to be a person they care about. And so inevitably one of the solutions is to do a composite character. And sometimes it's done well, sometimes it's done the right way. I would say what we talked about before in Saving Private Ryan, that, that Tom Hanks's character Though he, I don't think he was an actual person. Maybe he was a composite of other characters. It was well done. You were able to follow through this historical event uh, through the eyes of this made-up character, and you, st you still get the full impact and you get the history. Um, but again, as I reemphasize the Sogamon Tellerian story, you don't have to make up a composite character. When I first came to th this project. I didn't know of, I did, hadn't heard the name Sogamon Tellerian. That's what I was looking for. I'm like, Armenian genocide, this awful thing that happened. And I'm like, how can I tell this story? I may have to create a composite character. And then boom, uh, I didn't have to. So, all right. Uh, I think that's enough for now, Armin. Do you have any uh, other thoughts, final thoughts before we wrap up? So we were just talking about this before we started recording. And this is something that I myself am very excited about. So mm. in next in the following episodes, we hope to have a number of guests on our on our show on our podcast. What do we call it? Either one show podcast same thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, the number of people who have something to something interesting to offer on an aspect of the Kate of the Tellurian story and not directly related to it either. And so some of them happen to be people from Georgetown and others who are outside of the, the Georgetown community, but also are some very good friends of mine. I'm very happy and I'm really looking forward to, to talking to them whenever we get the chance to do it. 
Yes. So there's a tease for you. Those of you who have watched to this point in the video and in, in the show, uh, Armin and I have been working behind the scenes and uh, we're starting to put a schedule of guests coming up. And uh, we have two or three already confirmed. And uh, as far as exactly when they will come, we don't have that nailed down yet. But uh, we look forward to it in the future. We're going to have some uh, very impressive, I would say, guests coming up. They'll, they'll, uh, they'll have a lot to say. I think that the issue will be keeping our time down. Maybe we'll have to break it into two separate episodes, something like that, because there's going to be a lot that we want to talk about with these people. All right, Armin. Thank you so much, my friend. I'm enjoying this every time I get to talk to you and be on the podcast with Armin Manu Kaloyan. Huh, it's an honor. <laughs> All right. Good seeing you too, Michael. Take care. All right. Talk to you next time. Bye.